Good morning and welcome to Grace Presbyterian Church's virtual service. My name is Alvin Lin. I'm the associate pastor here. Our hope for you this morning is that you would experience the grace and truth that only comes from knowing Jesus Christ. Our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 49. And this psalm teaches us that God never forsakes his people, even in difficult times like these. And so would you please join me in the call to worship this morning as God has called us into his presence. This is a path of those who have foolish confidence, yet after them people approve of their boasts. Like sheep they are appointed for Sheol, death shall be their shepherd, and the upright shall rule over them in the morning. Their form shall be consumed in Sheol with no place to dwell. But God will ransom my soul from the power of Sheol, for he will receive me. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you that we have this great hope, this great assurance that you are always faithful to your covenant. You will never leave nor forsake your people, even in difficult times, even in times of suffering, and even unto death and after death, you are always with your people. Would that reassure us? Would that strengthen us? Would that help us? to continue to push forth as we walk through these uncertain and unknown times. Lord, you are majestic, you are powerful, you are sovereign. Help us to believe that. Help us to worship you and to experience the grace and truth that comes from knowing you. And we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please join me in our song of adoration this morning, led by Dan White. Thanks, Alvin. Good morning, everyone. Let's join together in singing, Jesus, I Come. Out of my bondage, sorrow, and night, Jesus, I come, Jesus, I come. Into thy freedom, gladness, and light, Jesus, I come to Thee. Out of my sickness, into Thy health. Out of my wanting, and into Thy wealth. Out of my sin, and into Thyself. Jesus, I come to Thee. Second verse. Out of my shameful failure and loss, Jesus, I come, Jesus, I come. Into the glorious gain of thy cross, Jesus, I come to thee. Out of earth's sorrows, into thy balm, out of life's storms, and into thy calm. Out of distress into jubilant song, Jesus, I come to thee. Verse 3. Out of unrest and arrogant pride, Jesus, I come, Jesus, I come. Into thy blessed will to abide, Jesus, I come to Thee. Out of myself to dwell in Thy love, out of despairing to raptures above, upward forever on wings like a dove, Jesus, I come to Thee. Last verse. Out of the fear and dread of the tomb, Jesus, I come, Jesus, I come. Into the joy and light of thy home, Jesus, I come to thee. Out of the depths of ruin untold, into the peace of thy sheltering fold, Ever thy glory is face to behold, Jesus, I come to thee. Jesus, I come to thee. 
Jesus, I come to Thee. Jesus, I come to Thee. Thank you. Thank you, Dan, for filling in for Joelle as she's feeling under the weather this week. As we turn to our confession of sin, let me state the obvious just for a reminder that our sins have a way of bubbling to the surface. They have ways of getting us caught at the most inopportune of times. You might have heard the story of the police officer in a pursuit of a man who had stolen another vehicle uh, driving out west. Uh, that man in the stolen vehicle promptly wrecked the car into another car waiting at a stoplight. Tragic, you might suppose. Unfortunate. Unfortunate for the driver of the other car because she also, it turns out, was driving a stolen vehicle. It was a two-for-one for the police that day. And we have to ask ourselves, are our sins any different? There we are thinking that we are covering them up and hiding them, and yet they have ways of making us get caught. Let's turn to the confession of sin. Please join me. Our God, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love, let not all the hardship seem little to you that has come upon us and all your people until this day. Yet you have been righteous in all that has come upon us, for you have dealt faithfully and we have acted wickedly. We have not kept your law or paid attention to your commandments and your warnings that you gave us, even in our own nation and amid your great goodness that you gave us and in the large and rich land that you set before us, we did not serve you or turn from our wicked works. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you humbled by the richness of your goodness to us, that you have not withheld your blessings and your kindness to us, but rather showered us with them, and yet we still sin. We still turn to wicked ways. And so we praise the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit for the name of Jesus at which we have the forgiveness of sins through his death and the resurrection. In Jesus' name, amen. Please join me for the words of grace from Colossians chapter 1, referring to Jesus. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Please join us for the affirmation of faith, and today we'll be doing two questions. Question 30, what is faith in Jesus Christ? Faith in Jesus Christ is acknowledging the truth of everything that God has revealed in his word, trusting in him, and also receiving and resting on him alone for salvation as he is offered to us in the gospel. What do we believe by true faith? Everything taught to us in the gospel. The Apostles' Creed expresses what we believe in these words. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, 
the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please join us for our songs of praise. Join with us in singing now, Jesus with thy church abide. Sing with me. Jesus with thy church abide. Be her Savior, Lord and God. While on earth her faith is tried. We beseech thee, hear us. We beseech thee, hear us. Keep her life and doctrine pure. Grant her patience to endure. Trusting in thy promise, sure, we beseech thee, hear us, we beseech thee, hear us. Third verse. May she one in doctrine be, one in truth and charity, winning all through faith in thee. We beseech thee, hear us. We beseech thee, hear us. May she guide the poor and blind seek the lost until she find and the broken hearted bind we beseech thee hear us we beseech thee hear us our hearts. May Jesus Christ be known wherever we are. We ask not for ourselves, but for your renown. The cross has saved us, so we pray your kingdom come. Let your kingdom come let your will be done so that everyone might know your name let your song be heard everywhere on earth till your sovereign work on earth is done let your kingdom come. Verse 2. Give us your strength, O God, and courage to speak. Perform your wondrous deeds through those who are weak. Lord, use us as you want. Whatever the test, by grace we'll preach your gospel till our dying breath. Let your kingdom come. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done 
so that everyone might know your name. Let your song be heard everywhere on earth till your sovereign work on earth is done. One more time. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done so that everyone might know your name. Let your song be heard everywhere on earth till your sovereign work on earth is done. Let your kingdom come. Let your kingdom come. Let your kingdom come. Thank you. Good morning and welcome to Grace Presbyterian Church. My name is Pastor Bob Willis. Thank you for joining us on our YouTube channel today. At this time, I want to give you an opportunity to make your tithes and offerings. Uh, we have two options for you. The first is through our P.O. Box number. The second is through our website. And as you're jotting down that information, let me highlight two announcements for you. The first is we have uh, these Gospel of John books that you can uh, have for free. Just text Pastor Alvin or Albert Lee. Uh, they have some at their house and you can swing by and pick them up. And then secondly, this, is our, this week is our once per quarter day of prayer and fasting. The elders invite the entire congregation to spend one day in prayer and fasting this week. You can pick the day and frequently community groups will do it together. If uh, you didn't receive an email with information or instructions about that, please email office at gracechesapeake.com for those files. And let me hand it over to Mike for our prayer today. Good morning, everyone. I'm Mike Gillander, a ruling elder at Grace. So earlier this month, J.I. Packer, who is arguably one of the greatest theologians of our times, went to be with the Lord. Packer authored many, many exceptional books during his 93 years on earth. His most well-known is entitled Knowing God, which I believe that every Christian should not only read, but also reread many times uh, in the course of their lives. Earlier in the book, Packer speaks of the importance of knowing God. He writes, quote, the world becomes a strange, mad, painful place, and life in it disappointing and unpleasant business for those who do not know about God. Disregard the study of God, and you sentence yourself to stumble and blunder through life blindfolded, as it were, with no sense of direction and no understanding of what surrounds you. This way, you can waste your life and lose your soul, end quote. The good news, however, for Christians is that the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as the only son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, we thank you that you have revealed yourself to us uh, through your Son, who became flesh and dwelt among us. We pray that every single day of our lives that you would help us to know you better and to love you more deeply. Thank you that you have provided for us uh, through the truth of your word and that your Holy Spirit is at, is at work in our lives. Give us a desire to know you better, to love Jesus more, to study your word more diligently, and to reflect the light of your glory for the watching world. Jesus, we are a very tired people, tired of COVID and many other things that are troubling in this fallen world. We are weary people. Give us the daily bread that we need, trusting that you are our provision in these difficult times. We ask that you would especially be with school administrators, teachers, and parents as we are approaching the start of a very uncertain school year. We pray for all of our friends at Tidewater Community College, especially the students who have been economically impacted this year, and for those who face food insecurity in their daily lives. We pray that you would provide for them everything that they need. Holy Spirit, 
we also pray that you would guide us in all the details of not only a temporary solution for grace, but also the more permanent one that we're looking forward to. You've been very good to this church since its beginning, and we know that your faithfulness will be evident in the future glory that lies ahead of us. We thank you in advance for how you will provide for us. Out of Jesus' fullness, we have all received grace in place of grace already given. We pray these things in the power of the resurrection and in the full assurance of the gospel truth. Amen. And now over to the blooper-free version of Bob's sermon. Thank you, Mike. Let's turn to our scripture today, John chapter 1, verses 14 through 18. Please pay attention as I read God's word. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. This is God's word. What if God was one of us? What if he was a slob like one of us? Just a stranger on the bus trying to make his way home. You might recognize that from back in the day. It was made popular by Joan Osborne and Tori Amos, but... Uh, one of my favorite artists from even further back in the day wrote it, Eric Bazilian from the, Ho the Hooters. It's a great question, though, because it speaks to the longing of the human heart. It, it speaks to implicitly, how do we know God? How are we supposed to get to know him? He seems unrelatable. He seems like he can't be known personally. And here the, the song is saying, what if he were just like us? What if he were so like us, he was a slob, maybe a little unrecognizable, a stranger on the bus on the way home? And I like this song because it really helps us to get to the crux of the issue. How is it that we can know God? So our outline today is three points. The Word became flesh, grace upon grace. And Jesus makes God known. He, he reveals God. Let's look at our first point. The Word became flesh. Verse 14. In my humble estimation, one of the most beautiful sentences ever penned. And there have been a lot of beautiful sentences that have been written. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen His glory, the glory of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And I want to focus in on this first part, the Word became flesh, and I want to give you two thoughts. Um, the first one is this, that God condescends to us. Now, before you start thinking that God is condescending, He is condescending, but not in the negative way. He's not doing it in an arrogant way. To condescend simply means to lower yourself to another's level. In other words, God became human being. He lowered himself from heaven to earth from the radiance of his glory to being a human being forever in the person of Jesus Christ. We call this the incarnation. God took on flesh. God became man. Remember our opening song, what I like about it so much is that we, I think we downplay the, the humanness, the fleshness of Jesus. I think because he seems like he's unrelatable or unreal in some fashion. We forget that he probably had dirt under his fingernails. That as he rode that bus home, he might have actually spilled coffee on himself. He was that human. And as we think about God's condescension to us, it really ought to move us to worship and awe and, and love for God. I was thinking back to the time when my boys were little toddlers and we would play matchbox cars and uh, we'd have all these big crashes and zip the cars along the floor. Think about it this way. 
If a toddler brought to his dad, what would you say about a dad who responded this way? If a toddler brought to his dad a matchbox car, looked up at dad, held the matchbox car, wanted to play, and dad stood there looking down with his arms crossed. Maybe dad was seated at a, a table and still looked down with his arms crossed at the kid, told his kid, you got to get up here. The toddler would have no way of climbing up an adult-sized chair, sitting in it, and playing at the table with dad with dad. And yet that's what dad demanded. If you're going to know me, you have to do these things. What would you say about a dad like that? What do most dads I know do? They get down on the floor and play cars with their toddlers. They condescend to the level of their child. They they stoop, they bend over, they sit down so that they can be at eye level and hand level to play with their toddlers. That's the incarnation. That's what God has done in the person of Jesus. He has condescended to our level. And it drives us to worship and awe and wonder and praise and joy that God loves us so much that he has reached down to us. And the second thought is when the Word becomes flesh, that he identifies with his people. He identifies with his people in profound ways, in personal ways, in relatable ways. John is describing Jesus who is very much like one of us. He's a slug and he's a, he's a slob. Can I say it without any dishonor to our risen Lord and Savior? Because what I'm trying to express is his, his humanity, his, his realness at being a human being. Because it's so very important. Because if he was God or somebody we couldn't relate to, then he can't be our Savior and he can't be our Redeemer. But rather he was perfect and he was real, a true Savior. But a true Savior, a perfect human being, Jesus causes us some problems because he critiques us. The perfect life critiques imperfect lives. Think about this way. When you're in the presence of greatness, you probably don't feel so great. When you're in the presence of power, your weakness becomes very keen. When you're in the presence of holiness and perfection, your sinfulness rises to the top and you become very aware of it. See, Jesus' life shows us how we should have acted, how we should have lived, how we should have loved, how we should have related, the things we should have done, the things we shouldn't do, the compassion that we, we should have had, the sympathy, the empathy, the kindness, the love, the patience, all of that, the generosity to other people, the trust and faith in his heavenly Father. See, Jesus' perfect life critiques our sinful ones. See, I think really what we want from Jesus is we want Jesus, but really not too close. Jesus, I'll take the next bus. Or you stay over there and, and I'll stay over here. And if I need you, I'll just kind of, I'll send you a text and maybe you can respond a little bit. But the Jesus we see here has come to us and he has, through his life, death, and resurrection, given us forgiveness of sins. St. Anselm of Canterbury lived about a thousand years ago, and he wrote this in Why God Became Man. It is necessary that the selfsame person who is to make this satisfaction for humanity's sins be perfect God and perfect man, since he cannot make it unless he is really God, and he ought not to make it unless he is really man. What's he saying from a thousand years ago? He's saying that in order for us to be saved, in order for our sins to be forgiven, that Jesus has to be fully God and fully man. He has to be fully God because the, the payment is so big, the debt for our sin is so enormous that only God has the resources to pay it. But it has to be a man because it's, a, it's humanity that's sin that owes the payment. And that's the beauty of the Incarnation that Jesus as God is able to make the payment for our sins and Jesus as man makes that and offers up those payments through his death and resurrection so that we have a perfect 
and true Redeemer. The Apostle Paul says it differently in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 5 and 6. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all. What wonderful words. Let's look at our next point, grace upon grace. You'll notice that the word grace is mentioned in a few places in this passage. We see in verse 14 that the Son and the Father in their fullness, they are full of grace and truth. Over in verse 17, we see that grace and truth come through Jesus Christ. And right there in the middle, in verse 15, from Jesus, we receive grace upon grace. I love this phrase, grace upon grace. Maybe, maybe we should change the name of our church, huh? Grace upon grace, Presbyterian Church. That'll fit nicely on a sign, I'm sure. We can make it fit in a 200 foot wide song. Grace upon grace. What comes to your mind when you hear that phrase? What do you think about? Niagara Falls, Horseshoe, the Horseshoe Falls at Niagara Falls are 180 feet tall. For you metric people, that's 57 meters high. As about 6 million cubic feet of water goes over the edge every minute, which is about 166 thousand cubic meters. If you can't wrap your mind around those numbers, it's about a million full bathtubs every minute go over the falls at Niagara Falls. And there's always more to follow. There's always more water. And it continually comes. And it continually flows. And it goes over and over. There is water upon water, heaps of water upon water. And it is the same way with Jesus' grace. It is grace upon grace. I think one of our struggles is that we like to talk about grace, but we don't have the imagination for the volume of the grace that Jesus gives us. And so we look to Niagara Falls and think, Jesus has more grace to give than there is water at Niagara Falls for everyday need. There is everyday grace. For unexpected need, there is unexpected grace. For ongoing suffering, there is ongoing grace. For dashed dreams, there is new grace. For the struggle against sin, there is grace heaped upon grace for you. For the weary, there is refreshing grace. For the hopeless, there is never-ending grace. For the dying, there is life-giving grace. There is grace upon grace upon grace upon grace for you. How do you need grace upon grace this week, this day, this moment? I know. Do you remember that earthquake in Chesapeake? I sure felt it. It occurred Tuesday evening. I don't know if you noticed it, but I was listening to music. Not only did I feel the earth shake and heard this loud, loud rumble, but I, I heard the residents and citizens of Chesapeake cry out in anguish and in fear and in frustration and in terror. It was Tuesday night. The school board of Chesapeake voted to start this school year with online classes. We need grace upon grace. Think of our teachers and anybody who works for the faculty or staff at any of our schools. You all need grace upon grace. I got a text from a, a teacher this week who said that his job was about to become wicked hard. And he's not even from Boston. And he sounds, and he's texting like he's from Boston. Wicked hard. Yes, S teachers' jobs have become amazingly hard and it's going to take incredible patience and incredible grace that Jesus has an abundance of for you to make it through at least the beginning of this school year and maybe the entire school year teaching online. I know you're frustrated because you want to be in class and yet we have this pandemic going on. It's a difficult situation all around. You want to be able to teach 
your students. And yet the online is going to be challenging, at least out of the gate. Parents, how's your stress level? How are you going to do with having your kids at home with online learning? What if both parents work outside of the home? How are you going to make it work? How are you going to do it? What if you're a single parent? I mean, being a single parent has challenges all the time. And yet, how is a single parent supposed to work, provide for their children, and school their kids at home at the same time? I mean, the situation is so complex. And yet, there is grace upon grace for you. And let's not forget the students. I was thinking back to when I was like seven years old in second grade. Uh, this should come as no surprise to you. But the highest marks, the highest grades I got in my report card were from recess and lunch. No, they didn't give grades. That's just where I excelled the most at. I can hardly sit still now. I mean, I feel like I'm in this little box with this video and being a televangelist that I can't even, there go my hands in any direction. I'm like stuck. I can't wiggle from side to side. I can't sit still now. I couldn't sit still back then. How difficult it is going to be for many of our students to try and learn in a, in a new way, in a challenging way, apart, distance from their teachers, without the hands-on uh, care and attention that teachers can give in a classroom. There is grace upon grace for you. Can I suggest something about our God? He is sovereign. In his good providence, he has ordained this schooling situation, whether you work with a school department, you're a parent, you're a student, he has tailor-made this situation for you so that he can pour out his grace upon grace to you. So that each and every day, as you try and focus on that camera screen or get your kids to sit still or figure out what's the best way to teach a subject online, there is grace for you. That God gives grace for patience. For you to continue to love the people you work with, to love your teachers, to love your students, to love your children, to love your parents, and all of that. He has ordained this for his glory to demonstrate that his grace is never ending and overflowing. Let's look at our, our third point. Jesus makes known God the Father. Let me read to you from John 14, verse 9. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. Whoever, Jesus says, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. Jesus' purpose, his role, if we want to put it this way, the, the good news that is the gospel, why he came to this earth, why he took on human flesh, is to take the invisible God and make him visible. To take the unknown God and make him known to his people, to take this God who seems so distant and unrelatable and bring him near and close and make him personal and relatable. It's impossible to know God apart from faith in Christ Jesus. It's impossible to know God, to relate to God in a right way apart from Jesus the Son. Jesus if you're a photographer and you had the opportunity to do a photo shoot of God and you got him in your studio, he would look exactly like Jesus. The pictures that you would develop would look exactly like Jesus. Hebrews 1.3, he, Jesus, is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. And after making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. God can be known. And if you desire to know God, he is known only through Christ Jesus. God has said to God the Father has said to God the Son, go take on human form in the person of Jesus. 
and make me known. Make me known to my people who I yearn to be with, who I long to be with. Make us separated no more. In John chapter 12, 21, some men came to Philip and they asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. We wish to see Jesus. Perhaps you're someone who doesn't know Jesus and wants to know God. Make this your prayer. Make this your heart cry, your longing. We wish to see Jesus. You're a parent pulling out your hair, trying to figure out schooling for your children. You're a, a teacher pulling out your hair, trying to figure out how to fulfill your vocation. We wish to see Jesus. What a profound prayer. We wish to see the grace of Jesus lavished upon us and one another. Grace upon grace. We wish to see Jesus who leads us to our Heavenly Father who makes Him known so that we can love Him and be loved by Him. Amen. Let's respond to God's word and song as we sing, We Will Feast in the House of Zion. Sing with me. We will feast in the house of Zion. We will sing with our hearts restored. He has done great things, we will say together, we will feast and weep no more. We will not be burned by the fire, He is the Lord our God, we are not consumed by the flood of hell protected gathered up we will feast in the house of Zion we will sing with our hearts restored he has done great things we will say together we In the dark of night, in the dark of night, before the dawn, my soul be not afraid for the promised morning. Oh, how long, O oh, God of Jacob, be my strength. We will feast the house of Zion. We will sing with our hearts restored. He has done great things. We will say together, we will feast and weep no more. Every vow, every vow we broke broken and be you are the faithful one And from the garden to the grave Find us together, bring shalom We will feast in the house of Zion We will sing with our hearts restored He has done great things We will say together We will feast And weep no more Please receive God's benediction Lift up your heads, your hands, 
in your hearts. From Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Go in peace.